brothers and sisters. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Natalie. Welcome to the English worship. Would you join together with me to pray? Father, we just come before you um, to seek your guidance and your will uh, amid a world of chaos, amid a world that really is just crying out to the only person who could fix everything, Lord. We ask that you be with us, that we would hear your words, and that you would guide us in the direction you would have us go, Lord. That through the message, through the song, through just changing our hearts, Father, that we would hear what you want us to hear today, so that we can be the light in the darkness. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. I could sing of in your love forever. I could sing of your love. 
thank you for joining us today for our English worship so that we can worship and praise together and we can hear God's word together. Uh, this morning we'll be lifting up a couple of things as a whole church. Number one, we'll be lifting up our political leaders as they continue to consider the various things it takes to open up our society in the coronavirus situation. Uh, we also want to be praying for our leaders as they con th consider thinking about uh, legislation in light of the, um, the uh, various uh, protests, um, the anger that's been taking place, um, that's uh, the concerns that have been raised by communities of color all throughout the world. We want to be praying for our leaders to be uh, considering all these different things. We also want to be praying for graduates. Uh, congratulations again to you elementary school, uh, junior high, high school graduates, college graduates, uh, grad school uh, graduates. Congratulations again. We want to be praying for you guys as um, God continues to lead your life. And we also want to be praying for our fellowship leaders. Um, that is all types of fellowship leaders who are continuing to guide and shepherd the people um, in this uh, very unique time. Would you please bow your head with me as we lift up these things as a whole church? Let's pray. Gracious God, we recognize that you are the only true God, the one that we worship, the one that we need every single day, the one um, who we live for, the one who we praise this very morning. God, we want to lift up these various needs, and we thank you, God, that we can come to you so freely through the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray, God, for our leaders in our nation, in our cities, all over the place, God. We pray, God, that you would continue to grant them wisdom and consideration as they think about all the different things it takes to open up our society in light of the coronavirus situation that we still find ourselves in. We also pray for the different reforms that are taking place all throughout the nation in consideration of the, uh, the um, hurts that communities of color have been experiencing since the death of George Floyd and all these other various incidents, Lord. We pray, God, for, um, we pray for the police. We pray, God, that there would be uh, deep reflection in everything that's been going on and that uh, we would continue to move towards a society that is uh, more equitable for all people and is is continue to be safe, Lord. We also pray, God, for the graduates in our midst. We thank you, God, for being so faithful to them. We thank you for bringing them to this place where they could finish up their school year and that many are, mo are moving on to new stages in life. Please guide them. Please remind them that you are with them. Remind them that you will always be by their side as they continue to go throughout this life. And I pray that they would continue to grow in their faith and in trusting you. Lord, we also pray for our various fellowship leaders who are faithfully leading your church and shepherding uh, the people in our church. We pray, God, that you would give them stamina, that you would give them perseverance, and that you would remind them that it is your spirit who is doing the work. Uh, we thank you, God, for all that you are doing in our midst. Lastly, Lord, we pray for your spirit to be with us as we go through your word, as we hear from uh, from Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and that we would be inspired, Lord, by your gospel to continue to reach out and to serve humbly, Lord. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, our scripture passage comes from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open up with me as we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23. This is the word of God. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. This is the word of God. 
Well, for the past few weeks, we've been talking a lot about rights and choices. And part of that is because in, we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians, where it talks a lot about um, the, how to make decisions as Christians. What are the rights that we have and what are the choices that we should make? What are the different considerations that we need to make? But also in our country and in our world, we've seen that people have had heated debates about rights and choices. When COVID-19 first hit, we were talking about whether people should exercise their right to go outside without a mask or not. Churches were debating about whether we should exercise our right to gather together or if we should forego that right altogether. Well, since the shelter-in-place laws came out, then the laws have then compelled everybody to stay indoors and to conduct services online. And since reopening, um, this has been another cause for us to consider what are our rights and what are the things that we need to consider in order to choose. Upon the death of George Floyd, our society has then turned its attention to what are the rightful exercises of authority. And then following that, there are also many debates about whether or not people should be exercising their right to protest. You know, as we can see, people care very dearly about their own rights. And I think the reason for this is because people care very dearly about their personal freedoms. We've been told all our lives that to be free is to be a more fully human person. When you make decisions for yourselves and you can make decisions um, based on your own desires and for your own good. That's why there are some intense debates about whether or not these rights should be given or taken away. Now, considering all this, what then could possibly lead a person to willingly and voluntarily give up their own rights? Well, oftentimes we might see a person being willing to give up their own rights when they see that something is more important than their own personal freedom. Or to put it another way, when a person believes that something is more worthwhile or that something is more at stake than their own personal right to choose. Well, while that can sound crazy, we actually see this all the time. Um, take for example, when people get married. When two people get married, they're effectively giving up their own right to be able to find another relationship and to be with another person romantically. Their personal freedom is being cast aside in order to gain something that in their own eyes is more glorious and more beautiful than being able to maintain their personal right to choose somebody else. People are willing to give up their own personal rights when they are convinced that something more important is at stake. Now, it's because of this very same principle that Paul writes verses 19 to 23 in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, telling the Corinthians that though he is a free man, that is, without a human master, he has essentially made himself a slave to all people, to serve all people, to accommodate to all people. Why would he do something like that? Why would someone willingly give up their freedom to conduct themselves in the way that they desire? Well, because it's because Paul has been captured by a treasure and an opportunity that is more glorious than him asserting his own right to live the way that he desires to live. And Paul, through the sharing of his own life here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, is inviting the Corinthians and inviting us to also make ourselves servants for the same beautiful cause. And so this is the theme of this morning's sermon, and which is, uh, our sermon's uh, title this morning is Make Me a servant. Now let's remember um, what Pastor Walter preached last week. Last week, Pastor Walter showed us that Paul had the right as an evangelist if he wanted to request from the people to financially support the work that he does as a preacher. Paul brought them to Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, and showed them the Old Testament principle that God endorsed workers to be able to enjoy the fruits of their labor and then argued that gospel preachers should be able to be able to make a living off of their gospel preaching. 
Yet Paul did not demand that he, that he himself as a preacher be paid or taken care of by the people he was preaching to. Um, and instead, he, uh, he says in verse 18 that he, his desire and the reason why he did this is because uh, that in my preaching, he writes, I may present the gospel free of charge. He had a reason for not making use of his right that he had, and it was so that money would not be a hindrance for, for people coming to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. That meant that Paul needed to make a living on the side, in addition to starting the churches that he was starting with the gospel. See, he was willing to forego his right to be able to ask for resources, and he was willing to take on the personal cost of the ministry, simply in order that the gospel might be able to reach more and more people. So now in this morning's passage, he's going to tell them more directly why he didn't take, uh, why he didn't take the money and how that mindset informs his ministry as well. In explanation for why he doesn't charge people money, he, uh, we, he writes this in verse 19, now coming into our passage this morning. He says, for though I am free from all, that is, I have the freedom to be able to choose to ask people for money, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. Now this statement would have been shocking to Paul's audience in the first century. Essentially, the social, stat the, the social statuses in the first century, in Paul's time, were stratified into different social um, social standings. And the biggest stratification, the biggest differences in social standing was between a person who was a slave and a person who was a freed person, a person who was a citizen or their, had their own freedom. A person with their own freedom had much higher social standing and a person who was, who was a slave had much lower social standing, social capital, you might say. Um, being a free person in Rome, uh, that is not being a bond servant, meant that you had uh, meant that you didn't need to answer to another person. It meant that Paul could go to work for whoever, wherever he pleased, and that he could go where he wanted. And these were rights that slaves did not have. But he says, Paul says that he is willing to become from a free person to a slave. In, essential, in metaphorically here, saying that he will be free from all, the epitome of freedom, especially in our books, right? Free from all to submitting himself as a slave, as a, what the Greek word is, doulos, to all. Now, Paul isn't literally bonding himself or selling himself or making himself a property to anybody here. But essentially what Paul is doing is he is taking on the attitude of ignoring the freedom of personal choice and instead submitting himself to working with great effort on behalf of and for the sake of every different group that he finds himself before. The way that we Christians today can treat being a servant uh, can look very different from the way that Paul talks about being a servant. I think part of that is because in the United States, we don't have servants, and that's a good thing. Um, but in the absence of servants, we have taken that word to be a servant, and we have made it very soft, very easy. Um, oftentimes, our conception of what it means to be a servant today is, if I have free time, and I have extra money, and I'm willing to spend, then I'll be able to offer my help. But Paul's attitude is not giving out of his leftovers, Paul's attitude is instead that he is willing to pay a personal cost to become a slave, to be in, enslaved, in other words, in serving greatly and passionately other people. It's a different kind of attitude than everyone else around him, and it's not hard to understand why it's so different. Because essentially, Paul is trading the role of being an, a privileged customer to then becoming an obligated waiter. And if we're honest, at first glance, none of us would normally choose that option either, would we? Um, but Paul has a motivation for his conduct and for his attitude. He says this, he says he does this 
that I might win more of them. That is, in his strong efforts to serve others, his motivation is that some of them might come and draw, might be, might come and be drawn closer to know Jesus Christ and the good news of salvation through him. He tells them how he takes on an attitude of a servant in order to bring the gospel to every kind of person. So let's read verses 20 to 21. He says, To the Jews I became a Jew, in order to win Jews. In or, to those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not, my, not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside of the law, I became as one outside of the law, not being outside of the law, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. You see, the cost of becoming a slave to others is a cost that Paul is willing to take and a cost he's willing to pay in order for some to be brought closer to Christ. Even though it's going to cost him his money, even though it's going to cost him his time, it's going to cost him his freedom, it's going to cost him his personal choice. And yet these are prices that he is willing to pay in order to bring the gospel to many. Now, a brief look at, at this passage, um, and we see that he reaches out to multiple kind of people, right? He reaches out to Jews. He reaches out to those under the law. He reaches out to those uh, uh, outside the law. And he reaches to the weak. Now, Paul is setting forth his life as an example for his audience. He wants them to take on a servant attitude. And I think he, we can see that he wants us to do this for three purposes, and that is he wants us to be made into servants, number one, for unbelievers, number two, for believers, and number three, for the glory of God. So first, we can see that he wants us to become radical servants for unbelievers, for those who do not believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again to grant us forgiveness. From this, we can start to see a pattern or even a method of how Paul does evangelism. I want us to see Paul's direction and also Paul's position as he does evangelism. The first thing to notice is that Paul doesn't try to win them by making them come to him. You notice that? He doesn't force them to learn his language and for them to become Christians in that way. But instead, his direction is to go towards them. He says to the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. Now, some of us might be thinking, now, wasn't Paul a Jew himself? Well, yes, he was Jewish. Um, but what he's talking about here and the people he's talking about are his fellow Jewish, uh, Jewish ethnic, Jew, ethnic Jewish people who are apart from Christ who have who are trying to find their justification before God through their ritual obedience and through following their laws and through being a Jewish person themselves. Now how does he try to reach them? He says that he became as a Jew, which means that in order to reach them, he was identifying with them in two important ways. The first important way is that he reached out to them relationally. He went into their circles and into their communities. For this, the, for the Jews, this was their synagogues. And this is where Paul would do most of his outreach. Secondly, it, mean, it meant reaching out empathetically. Um, that means that he took on a mindset of understanding the heart and the values and the desires of a person who was ethnically a Jew and who was trying to find their justification for God as a Jew. For the Jew, that was finding meaning in their history as God's people and finding uh, meaning in the ritual observances. So in getting closer to them relationally, that is going to their centers of community and in taking steps to understand them empathetically, that is understanding their values, Paul was in a much better position to bring the gospel of Christ to them in a way that they can understand and in a way that they could feel. He pointed them to how Christ was the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. He pointed them to them to the reality that 
Christ himself is the true offspring of Abraham and the one uh, and the man, and, and the one in whom Abraham put his faith in. He also pointed them to how the sacrifices were all pointing to the cross of Christ. And in understanding these ways and being with them near to them relationally, Paul was able to bring the gospel to them in these ways. But again, notice that he doesn't say to them, he doesn't say to the Corinthians that they became as I am. But rather when it comes to telling them about Jesus, Paul actively strives to meet them where they're at. Paul's direction is outwards. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this is the same direction, outward direction, that Jesus gives his great commission to the apostles. When he's giving this great commission to the apostles, he's giving the mission of God to the apostles to go and make disciples of all nations. He doesn't say to them, stand still, disciples will come to you. No, of course not. He says, go. He says, get out of here. He says, go forth, onward, outward, go and make disciples of all nations. And that is the posture that a servant takes. A servant is outward looking. A servant is active, actively seeking how to go to the person for whom they are obligated to serve. And it calls us, this servant attitude, this servant missional attitude calls us to what is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable because love is uncomfortable and Christ is calling us to bring his love to the whole world and to the lost, those and everybody who don't know Christ. Now, I'm not saying that Christians should not invite people to church. Um, that is one of the ways that we can be active in bringing Christ to people is inviting them to church. But we have to be honest and we cannot be sitting around thinking that we should just wait for people to enter through the doors of our church, expecting them to come to us to hear the good news of Christ. If we want the world to know that there is salvation in only one name, and that is Jesus Christ, we have to expect our feet to move. We have to expect our lips to talk. And we have to expect our hearts and our hands and feet to go outward, to reach out to others to the people whom God has placed in our lives. Now, we should note that Paul's goal was never simply to become the same as his audience. Now, some people uh, fall into this danger um, when they think about reaching out to others. Uh, some believe that in order for them to reach out to others, they need to not only stand, understand where they come from, but they need to agree and fully participate in the activities that they do. Um, but if your ministry, for example, and it's this is a glorious ministry. If your ministry is to those who are in prostitution, um, you do not have to be engaged in prostitution in order to reach out to them, uh, nor should we endorse such a lifestyle. Um, but instead, Paul has a direction that he is aware of, but he's not only aware of his direction, he's also aware of his position in Christ. We can see this as he writes this, in starting with the second half of verse 20. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. See, he knows that when he goes out to reach those under the law, that is, those both Jews and Gentiles, who are trying to be justified by their own law-keeping, he keeps in mind that he himself is not justified by the obedience to the law, but, by, but through faith in Christ's sacrifice. But he holds on, uh, but holding on to both his direction and his position, he empathizes with them, understanding the, the efforts that it takes for them to try to uh, satisfy God through their own efforts. And with that understanding, brings them to Christ. Now, in the same way, he, when he goes to reach those outside the law, that is, those who don't follow or believe in the God of the Old Testament or his laws, he keeps in mind that he's still living for the glory of Christ and holding on both to his outward direction and his position in Christ. He gets near to them and understands how to reach out to them. 
What we should notice in all of this is that Paul is not so proud to, and not so apathetic to recognize how to act winsomely to those he's reaching out to, even though he knows his own position. He is still willing to make every effort to reach out to any group that he finds himself before. We actually see this method of Paul's evangelism in the book of Acts, in chapter 17. Now, Paul goes to the philosophy hub of Athens, Greece, kind of like uh, kind of like going to San Diego Comic Con, where it's the hub of everything comic related and fantasy and video games and movies and all sorts of different things. Um, and Paul goes to this for philosophy. Um, and he takes on the mindset of a philosopher, takes on their style of reasoning, and seeks to reveal God and Christ through this rhetoric and through philosophy. It's really great. Go check out Acts chapter 17 sometime, and we could take cues of his evangelism to them. Um, and as we read, as we read, as we come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul emphasizes his point of service and his method by emphasizing that he reaches to a people group um, by becoming like that people group in order to reach that people group. And if I were to compare Paul to an animal, Mm, I would say that he's like an octopus. Not because of eight legs, um, but did you know that octopi can change their color according to their background, according to their surroundings? Um, not only can they change their color, which is really fascinating when you see it, but they can also change the texture of their skin so that an octopus can be mistaken as a rock or a piece of coral, which is really awesome. And what's even more awesome is that Paul in consideration of his audience, it, it, he becomes like them, but not in order to hide from predators and not in order to eat something. <laughs> um, he becomes like them in order to serve them because he has become a slave unto them in this way in order to bring them the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Again, Paul sets forth his life as an example to believers uh, as an effort of personal sacrifice. Um, the effort it takes for us to reach the lost. Now, I want to invite you to think of your unbelieving co-workers, your unbelieving family members and friends. I want you to think about how these people could possibly reach a relationship with God without having the bridge of Jesus Christ in their life. For those of us who are Christians, we are called to bring good news good news of God's love and sacrifice to those who are lost. How are we going to do this? How passionately will we go to reach out to those who don't know him? Again, you've probably heard it said in our day and age that no one cares how much you know or what you know until they know how much you care. And I believe that's totally true. And to that end, it's very important that we uh, can follow Paul's model in getting close to them relationally. And as we get close to them relationally, going into their communities, uh, going into their spaces of, uh, spaces of meaning, things that are meaningful to them, we also learn how to empathize, learning how to take on, their, uh, take on and understand their values, their fears, their worries, the things that have gone on in their life. Taking a genuine, loving interest in another person's life will position you in a much better place to bring the good news of Christ to their life. They will see that you truly care for them, and you will know the aspects of their hearts that really need to be filled by Christ. So what are some concrete ways that you and I can reach out, to, uh, can reach out and point people to Christ? Um, well, one way is in... Uh, in sharing your own stories of Christ in your own life. Another is inviting them to church events. Uh, you can also connect them with material that connects them to God, like sending them Bible verses, to, uh, Instagram, an Instagram about a, uh, a God story. You can also send them sermons, send them a link to this sermon or another sermon, or reading a Christian book together. 
Um, one book I might recommend if you're having trouble thinking of books is a book called For Your Joy by Pastor John Piper, which gives the gospel in a very brief and very succinct but very beautiful way and tells us of our need and why we can find our joy in Christ. In order for us to reach the lost, how can you connect with others relationally and empathetically in order to bring Christ into their lives? This is a practice that we Christians need to do in every area of life, you know, in areas of our family, of our work, and even of all the content that we see on social media. How can we practice being empathetic to all types of people and praying that all people would come to know and come closer to Christ? But Paul's servant attitude doesn't stop there. Paul doesn't just want Christians to be servants for unbelievers, but his servant attitude also uh, demands that we bring the gospel for believers, too. For those of us who have been joining sermons for the past couple of weeks, do you remember what the main context of chapters 8 to 11 of 1 Corinthians is? Um, it's a situation where some group, of, uh, some group of Christians whom call, Paul calls the weak are being challenged in their consciences when they see other people eating meat around them that might have been dedicated to idols. Now remember, he doesn't use the term me, uh, uh, weak in a mean-spirited way. He just uses the term to describe these new Christians who have been eating meat in worship idol for so long that they wouldn't be able to eat meat that was even associated with idols without in their own hearts worshiping idols. And so now, in the same context, Paul is, telling them, uh, uh, Paul is telling them how to reach out to unbelievers, right, in, for, in chapter 9. Now, in, that con in, the chap in the context of chapter 9, without skipping a beat, he says, let us reach out to also the weak by becoming like the weak in order to win the weak. It's at this point that we're reminded that of the situation taking place in Corinthians and why Paul, in the middle of this letter, is talking about sharing, is talking about letting go of his right to be paid as a pastor and, and laying down his right to conduct himself however he wants in front of other people. These are not random topics that Paul is bringing up here just to show off. But he's bringing out these topics as an example to the proud Corinthian people that they should be laying down their own freedom and their own rights in order to serve those, uh, those who are weak in order to love them and bring them closer to Christ. You know, some of these proud Corinthian Christians are saying that, you know what, I know that idle meat is just plain old meat. And so I'm going to go eat meat. And you know what? The best meat can be found in the temples because that's where people really want to offer their offerings to the idols. So I'm going to go and I'm going to eat the meat that's offered in the temples. As they do this, they do this in spite of the fact that their brothers and sisters of Christ might follow their example and in their hearts will perceive themselves to be worshiping an idol, worshiping false gods. Well, why does Paul say that these people, the weak, need to be one. If the weak are already Christians, why do they need to be one? Well, for these so-called weak brothers and sisters, they don't need to be one in order to know Christ, but they need to be one in order to be drawn closer to Christ, and they need to be drawn closer to Christ and away from temptations that would cause them to worship other false gods. And the fact is, that all Christians need to be drawn closer to Christ. Amen? Why do Christians, why do Christians, why need to be reached out to? Why do we need to be reached out to with the gospel? Well, it's a similar principle that for doctors and for health professionals. Doctors, though they give out and prescribe medicine, they still get sick and sometimes need the medicine that they give out to others. Uh, physical therapists, help others with their muscles, but they too need the exercises that they give their clients. In the same way, though we have been forgiven and spiritually healed by Christ, we need daily healing from Christ. Not because we lose our forgiveness every day and thereby need new forgiveness today, 
But because of the illness of sin and guilt in our life that still exists, it needs to be treated with a reminder of his love that has purchased our salvation and that gives us freedom to have relationship with God and a freedom to live for God. The truth is that every Christian, every day, needs a reminder of the gospel. That is, we need to be reminded of the good story that preaches to us about how while we were still sinners, God sent Jesus Christ to die in our place, to take the punishment for our sin in order that we might be forgiven and in order that we might be brought back into relationship with God the Father. And the truth is we are so forgetful. As the old hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. And that is not me blaming any of us, you or myself. It's just a simple fact. And so then the gospel is something that we never graduate from. The gospel, the story of Christ's death and resurrection for our forgiveness is not first grade theology that we just end up moving past and we just keep in the back of our minds and just end up forgetting. No, we are so prone to our prideful egos that we forget that Christ is our only righteousness. And we are so prone to anxiousness that we forget that God is our loving Father who takes care of us. And we are so prone to forget that uh, we are so prone to lusting after things of this world that we forget that God himself is our joy and our reward. But if anything we see from Paul here is that he is concerned with the spiritual well-being of the brothers and sisters in Corinth. And he knows that he can do something about it by drawing them closer to Christ. And in this, con in this context, it's by not being a stumbling block and by not tempting them to worship false gods by eating, in the present, eating idol meat in their presence. And Paul is saying to the Corinthians, I want you to have the same heart I want you to have the same kind of passion to bring one another, your brothers and sisters, closer and closer to Christ. To be willing to be a servant and lay aside your own rights for the good of your brother and sister. For those of us who call ourselves Christians, what about us? How might you serve your brother and sister this week in order to point them to our Savior? Since being sheltered in place, I know that many of us have lost typical opportunities that we would have had, you know, to use our time and energy to serve as either an usher or on tech crew. Uh, and this is a challenging time, challenging time for our church, including in the areas of exercising our spiritual care for one another and being able, able to exercise our gifts to serve one another. But many people are hurting spiritually nowadays. And more than ever, we ourselves and our brothers and sisters in Christ need gospel pointing. And we need people to remind us of the good news of Christ, of the freedom we have in him, of the love that is so persistent every single day. We need each other to point each other to Christ. So may I offer some suggestions for us. If you are in a place where you've been missing out on spiritual community, I want to invite you to join for our weekly Sunday morning prayer, prayer time where we can come, come close to each other, relate to each other, and lift each other up in prayer. You can come also to the Sunday school that happens on Tuesdays that we can learn and study God's word together and continue to be sharpened in our life by reading and studying God's word. Um, if you are trying to think of ways to encourage each other, start by a simple text. A, call, a phone call, an email to each other can mean so much to another brother and sister in our midst. Uh, in this church, we might have two campuses, but we are one family. And as family, we should be taking care of each other, asking how we can help each other. And I pray that this is something that we can grow into. I pray that as a community, we would be anchored onto the gospel of Christ and going out of our ways to serve and love one another. So we've seen how Paul is a doulos, is a servant, for unbelievers and also for believers. But this last part here, in the last section, 
we see how he tells us why he becomes a servant. He says in the middle of verse 22, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. We see here what motivates Paul is not just the benefit of un of for unbelievers themselves or even for the benefit of believers themselves, but what he what it all comes back to for Paul is that becoming a servant is for the glory of God. How do we see this? He says in verse 22 that everything he does is for the sake that he and others might be people who experience the gospel. He is willing to become all things for all people and will take all means, doing it all, he says, for the sake of the gospel. <laughs> this gospel is of top importance for Paul. He is willing to do everything for the sake of the gospel. That means to do everything for the fame and the renown of this story. And this story is all about God's love, uh, God's love, and it's all to the credit of God because he's the one who saves us and loved us first. That's why the gospel is all about God's glory. And the result is that like the many others who Paul reaches out to, Paul himself will be able to enjoy the blessings of the gospel. Like he says um, that some may enjoy the blessings of this gospel. Uh, what is the gospel? Again, the gospel is the story that tells us how while we were still sinners, God sent Christ to die and claim victory over sin in his resurrection so that we can have a restored relationship with God again. This story, this act of love that God has given to us is Paul's preoccupation. This is his target. This is his goal. For Paul, the gospel is like he's shooting an arrow and becoming a servant is him pulling back the bow, the bowstring, and firing the arrow. The target is the audience that he wants to bring the gospel to and that he wants to impact. That is the target. But the very center, the bullseye that Paul is aiming for is the glory of God, is to bring God praise and glory. For Paul, the gospel is also the fuel that drives his engine. His car, his vehicle, is going to people to serve them. And it's the gospel that energizes him and brings them, brings him to them. And for Paul, the gospel is his treasure and his prize. Uh, the gospel for him is the million dollar prize that waits at the end of the great race, at the, the amazing race that he, that, uh, that he would run hard in, that he will find every clue for, that he will seek under every single rock in order to get that million dollar prize. So in this entire section, Paul wants us to make our personal freedom secondary to serving others and serving others the means by which we magnify the gospel but here's the question though and the answer to this question will determine how far you and i will go to serve others and that is this are we personally convinced of the gospel's worth are we convinced that the gospel is the target, the bullseye of our lives, that the glory of God is what we are striving for and the purpose of our lives? Without ourselves becoming convinced of the beauty and the supremacy of God's glory and his gospel, we will not be able to serve others the way that we are being called to. Perhaps if we diagnose in ourselves a lack of service to the lost, and a lack of service to our brothers and sisters, perhaps we'll find that what we are missing is the gospel's true worth in our hearts and our minds. That what we're missing is a full understanding of how worth it the good news of Christ is and how necessary it is for us to bring people closer to God and how great it is to give God all the glory. As we mentioned before, even Christians need to be reminded of the gospel on a daily basis. But I really believe that the more that God's story of love and redemption 
becomes a central part and purpose in our lives, the more we will be moved into sacrificial, radical service to, for the lost and for the church. Why? It's not only because of the story of God is just so glorious and so grand, but it's also because the gospel story is the story of God's radical service to you. It's a story of how far God went to reach us when we were lost. It is a story of God's sacrifice for our spiritual health and our eternal health. And that same gospel is inviting us to follow in the footsteps of our Savior, to serve mightily to reach the lost and our brothers and sisters. So as we close, I want to invite, give this invitation out. For our non-Christian friends and family this morning, God is giving an invitation to you to hear and to see how great his love is for you and the price that he paid for you in order to have a restored relationship with God. God is reaching out to you and he wants you to know that he, his love is made available to you and that you can know his service and his love in your life. So Christians, to Christians, God's invitation for us is return to the gospel. Return to the story of God's radical service to, for you and for me. And through it, may we see the joys of becoming a radical servant for others and for God's glory. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we see through the life of Paul that he was willing to lay down his freedoms, take on inconvenience, and to pay a high cost to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to the lost and to his brothers and sisters. And he saw that it was worth it. In all the same, God, we see also the, the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. God, and we are humbled. We are humbled and we are won over, Lord. God, I pray, Lord, that for our unbelieving friends and family this morning, that they would be won over one day, that you would help them to see how great you are and how wonderful it is to be a servant to others and to, uh, and to everyone around us. And I pray, God, for our brothers and sisters, Christians in our midst, that you would help us to awake from our slumber, to awake from our weak willedness to serve others and to serve each other. That you would help us, God, to serve others mightily, to be willing to go take the far cost, to be near to those, to empathize with those in order to serve them and to bring the gospel of Christ to them. That they would be, that they would be drawn closer to Christ. We thank you, God. Challenge us this week of how to reach out to others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us this morning for our worship. We do this all for the good news of Christ and for his glory. And we want to now uh, just share some announcements for, uh, for all of us to this morning. Um, we want to first announce and remind, every, remind everybody that next week on June 21st is Father's Day. So we want to ask you to please invite your father and grandfathers to join us for the online worship services. Here in the uh, English worship, we will be having a short, little, fun little video in commemoration of Father's Day, and we hope that you can join us for that. The second announcement that we want to remind people of is that the 2020 CEF virtual retreat uh, that's taking place on July 3rd to 5th is, has a deadline to sign up for today. The deadline to sign up for this retreat is today, June 14th. So contact Julie today. Um, again, pa uh, our, our very own Pastor Sunny Wan will be preaching as a speaker and also Pastor Alan Loon. There's Julie's contact information there. You can find out more information from there. We also want to remind people that we have our English Adult Sunday School, um, which is taking place bi-weekly on Tuesdays. Uh, we have this Sunday School um, taking place again this upcoming Tuesday on the 16th from 8 p.m. on Zoom. And this week, we're going to be taking a look at God's mighty rescue of the Israelites from Egypt and how it paints a picture of even, an even mightier salvation that God would bring through Christ. 
If you have any questions, please e email me at that email you see there. We also want to give an update for our brothers and sisters um, that our leaders have been continuing to keep an eye on the situation, the pandemic situation, and that after a couple of weeks of being in a uh, shelter in place, that we see that the situation, especially the rates of infection in the Bay Area, have not slowed down yet. And so for that reason, we are still planning to continue our online services for the time being. And we hope that you'll continue to persevere, that you continue to find ways to uh, to connect spiritually with your community, and also to be able to remind yourself of the gospel every single day. Um, to that end, I want to invite us. Uh, I want to invite us to uh, to receive the closing benediction, which is coming from Jude, verse twenty-four and twenty-five. Um, thank you for joining our service. Would you please bow your head with me as we receive the closing benediction? Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you again for joining us this morning for worship. We pray that you have a great week. God bless. Receive the gospel. Go and reach out and serve others.